In the name of Christ, we welcome you to this time of worship with Shadyside Presbyterian Church. If you haven't done so already, we encourage you to sign the virtual friendship pad, which can be found by clicking the link in today's bulletin or in the video description for today's service. Friends, as the weather begins to change and we enter the fall season, we know that the continued disruption to our life as a church is carrying on far longer than any of us anticipated, and that is taxing. In the midst of it all, I have found great comfort and hope in discovering the new ways that God is working in and through our church, the new ways that people are finding of connecting with and truly being the church for one another. And I'm excited to see where it is that God is leading us. We hope that you will come alongside of us in this time of discernment and discovery. Keep checking the church website and the weekly bulletins to see what opportunities await you and seek the ways that God is calling you to be involved. And maybe you'll find God calling you to something beyond what you find listed there. If that's the case, reach out to any of the pastors or staff members. Let us know how the Spirit is leading you. Share with us your needs and desires. Share with us the gifts that God has given you to offer Christ Church. We continue to delight in hearing the Spirit speak through each of you as we seek to faithfully follow Christ into the future that he has planned for us. Now may we raise our voices as our hearts are joined in worship. Praise the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty doings of the Lord or declare all his praise? Happy are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Save us, O oh Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord.
Friends, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Trusting in God's grace and mercy, let us confess our sin together. God of wisdom, we have dwelled in foolish ways, turning away from you to follow the desires of the world. We have sought worldly gain over the needs of our brothers and sisters. We have given in to anger, hate, and fear, rather than compassion and mercy. We have jumped to conclusions rather than waiting patiently to learn. Forgive us, gracious God, and turn us back to your way through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Persistently, patiently, lovingly, God pours out grace and mercy into our lives, healing us of brokenness. May the God of all mercy forgive you all your sin, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us pray. God of mercy, grant that your word may take root in our hearts and bear fruit to your honor and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is taken from the prophet Isaiah chapter 5. Hear the word of the Lord. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste, it shall not be pruned or hoed and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second scripture passage is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. Listen to the word of God. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to the tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death, lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of mercy, you promised never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generations, speak your eternal word that does not change. Then may we respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Both our Isaiah passage and our Matthew passage open with a detailed description of a landowner's elaborate plan to transform a field into a vineyard. We can imagine the painstaking efforts of erecting a fence to protect the future fruit. And with hopeful confidence, the landowner goes through the trouble of digging a wine press before the first vine takes root. So we imagine a fenced-in field with a wine press awkwardly placed within it, and the landowner is not quite finished. No, the fence offers some protection for the choice vines. But these vines need protection beyond the fence, so any threat of harm can be prevented. A watchtower will allow for protection beyond the fence. The landowner now has a fenced-in field, transplanted choice vines, a wine press raring to go, a watchtower to protect the fruit from any threat seen in the distance. So what has the landowner forgotten? The vineyard is protected from all that can be seen. What offers protection from what is unseen. Growing up in the hills of Ohio, the only grapevine I knew was the unruly variety that grew to the treetops. These vines produced no edible fruit, but they certainly provided entertainment. Once the vine reached a certain height, one could cut it from the ground cling tightly to the freed vine and run as fast as one could. 
the momentum bent the tree branches until Newton's laws of motion would kick in. The tree branches would fling back, lifting the runner high into the air. The grapevine offered me my first sensation of flying, followed by my first sensation of crashing. There were no watchtowers to protect either the vine or myself from one another. It was when Linda and I were engaged that I saw a true for my first true vineyard. The views were breathtaking. I was soon taken aback by the roses within the vineyard. I was stunned the first time I saw the beauty of these roses. It was as if the roses in the vineyard acted as the exclamation point to the long sentence of grapevines meandering through the hillside. The view was breathtaking. But the roses seemed extravagant, excessive, unnecessary because the vineyard was beautiful without them. But I learned the roses were placed more for function than beauty. Certain pests and disease which could impact the vineyard would first harm the more vulnerable roses. When the caretaker sees the rose struggling, adjustments can be made to protect the vineyard. Roses protect the vineyard from the unseen. Our landowner forgot to mention the roses. Matthew's text opens with Jesus continuing a dialogue with the chief priests and Pharisees of the temple. And telling them yet another vineyard parable, Jesus opens more or less by borrowing words from Isaiah. Isaiah's text read early is literally a love song. And with Jesus speaking Isaiah's words, the religious leaders were drawn back into Isaiah's vineyard. They had sung this song before. They knew well the lyrics. In Isaiah's telling, the vineyard of God's people produced only wild grapes. So the owner of the vineyard removed its hedge, tore down its wall allowed the vineyard to be trampled and the ground to go dry. The fruit of this vineyard was worse than no fruit at all. In Isaiah's play on words in Hebrew, the vineyard owner expected mishpat, but saw mishpah, expected sedekah, but heard only sayaka. As fruit of the vineyard translated, the landowner expected fruits of justice, but saw bloodshed. Expected the fruits of righteousness, but heard only cries. So in his opening words, Jesus drew the religious leaders back into that tragic love song. And I suspect that song had one of those catchy tunes which stuck in their heads. Jesus draws them back into Isaiah's vineyard. Yet through a parable, Jesus changes the lyrics once they are drawn in. And the power of a parable is that it either convicts or infuriates, and sometimes both. And a parable can be dangerous when such conviction is evaded and assigned to another. As the parable goes, the vineyard owner sends his slaves to gather his portion of the produce. And the vineyard tenants kill the slaves. 
The owner sends more a second time, and they are killed as well. The righteous owner then sends his own son, who then is killed also. What is the vineyard owner to do? They say, but destroy the current tenants and choose new tenants worthy of caring for the vineyard. Such great harm has been done by pulling this parable from its greater context and assigning its conviction to our Jewish sisters and brothers. The interpretation is that those early slaves were the old prophets who warned Israel to change their behavior. The following slaves were those later prophets who continued to warn Israel of the same. The son who was killed outside the vineyard was Jesus, who was later removed and killed outside of Jerusalem. The landowner should rid the vineyard of the old tenants and appoint new tenants. The tragic part of history is that Christians have identified as these new tenants and have too often taken upon themselves to remove their Jewish tenants. Parables are dangerous when their conviction is evaded. What is the landowner to do with the tenants, the keepers of the vineyard? Will we allow ourselves to evade the conviction of this parable? How are we doing as tenants of the vineyard? How sweet is the fruit? How is the vineyard producing as it enters its third millennium under our care? Reminded of the vineyard fruit described in Isaiah, does our vineyard produce an abundance of justice? Are our vines generating righteousness? It is a difficult task caring for a vineyard. Often the task seems too large, too overwhelming. The fruit is not maturing as quickly as we like. I fear such burden of the vines has led us to become distracted by the roses, focusing too often on the roses. Roses are a benefit, a gift for tending the vineyard. They protect the vine so fruit may be produced. Their beauty, their their scent draws us in, and they are good. The roses are those aspects of faith that keep the tenants going. They help to protect faith in times of trouble. And Lord knows we need the roses. We are stewards of them as well. But the roses are not the purpose for the vineyard. Perhaps we spend too much effort caring for the roses. The many benefits that come along with our being tenants, stewards of the vineyard. The hard reality is that when ripe, the grapes are messy. They have a way of staining us, getting into our skin. They're also heavy. Fruits of justice and righteousness. The thought is enough to weigh us down. 
how can we be expected to nurture and carry such fruit? Dealing with the fruit of the vineyard is a labor-intensive, messy business. Hard labor. It feels safer, lighter, to care for the roses. Though the roses produce no fruit. Yet there is hope. Hope for the tenants and hope for all those who are in need of this kingdom fruit. Here at the church, outside my office window, there is a grapevine growing. And one can see it climbing the walls of our church, making its way into my windows. And I should apologize to the property committee for not making you aware of this until now. But I like them being there. These grapevines serve as a reminder to me that God is at work both inside and outside the church. That God is working within us in all that we do. And God is working beyond us in all that God does. And just as this grapevine is making its way from the outside into the church, the church is to make its way outside and into the community. The vineyard grows beyond the walls of the church because God is present beyond the walls of the church. The sweetest fruit of justice and righteousness exists where the labor of the church interacts with God's work beyond the church. The vineyard's current tenants are to join in the messy labor of the harvest because it seems we are in a time when some fruit is ripe. So in this time, let us not fret over the roses as together we join in the efforts of the harvest. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us now join together in affirming our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us join our hearts in prayer. God, our Creator, you have made us by your own breath and called us by name. And so we humbly bow in gratitude for your boundless love, a love that we know best in your gift of your Son, Jesus. We thank you that your reach is beyond all our imaginings, that your grace knows no limit. We lift to you now the concerns of our hearts, believing that you hear our prayers and you desire all that is good for your world. You understand, O oh God, the burdens that your children bear. Some are struggling with illness. Some are fearful. Some are discouraged. Some are exhausted in body and heart. Some, Lord, are grieving today, for they have lost someone dear to them, or perhaps something cherished, a job, a home, a sense of belonging, a special relationship, a treasured dream. You are the great healer, O oh God. You alone can bring life from death. By your Holy Spirit, bring clarity to those who are confused. Bring companionship to the lonely. Give comfort to those who are filled with anxiety. Give renewal to those who despair. We pray for our nation and our world, for those whose lives and communities have been devastated by disease, by violence, by natural disaster. Let the strength and power of your spirit bring peace and hope. May the vision and work of your kingdom prevail. We thank you, God, that you have called your church into being that you have set us here in this time and place to be a part of the witness of the body of Christ. Keep us faithful, Lord, so that the good news of Jesus may be boldly proclaimed by us and through us until the day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. We pray in his name even as we pray as he taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look to you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.